Hey, everybody, welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast, where you get to learn everything you want to know about addiction and recovery. I'm your host, Angela Pugh, co founder of Kansas City Recovery, life coach, and recovering alcoholic. To learn more about me, you can listen to episode zero on your podcast app or find us on the web at addictionunlimited.com. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode number 232 of the Addiction Unlimited podcast. I'm your coach, Angela Pugh. Thank you for hanging out with me today and spending some time with me. I appreciate you so much. I hope you're in our Facebook group with us too. We have great discussions in there, tons of support. It's totally private. So if you haven't joined us over there, you should definitely jump over and do that. We're going to do something a little bit different today. Now, many of you may know, many of you probably don't know actually, but (laughs) the first about 100 episodes of Addiction Unlimited are no longer available on the internet or in your podcast apps. And there were many reasons for that. I mean, they were old, like, you know, in my beginning days of podcasting, which were really interesting looking back on them now. But we also had some really great episodes back then. And now I released the first 100 episodes in the Sober Society membership only. And really, they didn't show those first 100 episodes on most podcast apps anyway. Like I get messages and emails constantly with people saying, hey, where do I find these episodes? The only... Only this many episodes are showing up on my podcast app. Where are the other ones? Because they just can't, I guess they can't show them all or keep them all. I don't know. So I just made the executive decision to make that something that was available to my Sober Society members only. And I released them in there. They live in Sober Society membership. And I released different ones uh, in different months according to whatever topics we're discussing that month. And then they have access to those. There are some episodes, like when we had super popular guests on and things like that in the first 100 that are still available, but the majority of them are only available in Sober Society. So I decided for this week's episode that I wanted to go back in the archives and find some really good episodes that I could bring back to you guys. And I found this one, it was episode number 89. Five Truths You Must Accept to Battle Addiction. I love this episode. Um, Bear bear in mind that any links or anything you hear in in this episode are probably outdated. I think there's a link in there to book a call with me. If you want to work with me and book a call with me, do that at addictionunlimited.com forward slash call. And I do have a couple of spots opening up in my uh, individual private coaching. So if you want to do that, addictionunlimited.com forward slash call, and I will put that in the show notes as well. But if I talk about any other like promotional things, workshops, anything like that, just remember this episode is super old, so none of that stuff will apply. But always join us in the Facebook group. Um, You can find us, Addiction Unlimited you can search that on Facebook and find our group pretty easily. It's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash addiction unlimited and the book a call link. I think that's all that we really have going on right now. (laughs) It is recovery month and we're posting a lot of cool stuff for that and trying to be supportive there. And we have some big things coming up for sober October. So I will keep you posted on that, but I hope you love this old episode. If my podcasting sucks, remember it was my first hundred episodes and and I might be bad. I don't know, but this is five truths you must accept to battle addiction. Thanks so much for being here with me, you guys. Five truths you must accept to battle addiction because to be effective in this battle, you have to get clear on what the F you are doing If you are serious about making progress in anything, you have to get clear on your vision, have a plan, and it really needs to be on paper. My first lesson in the importance of writing things down was with my sponsor. He made me write everything out before I would call him to like complain or vent about anything. And literally, when I called him, the first thing he asked me is, did you write it out? And if my answer was no, he would just hang up. 
So I would go write it out, and of course, I would feel a thousand times better, and then I'd call him back. (laughs) And that may sound a bit harsh to you, but I knew he wasn't being mean or unkind in any way. He was just asking me to do something good and healthy for myself. And when he became my sponsor, he told me that this was a part of his process, and I agreed to that and committed to doing that work. All he was doing was holding me accountable to what I had already committed to. And this was a huge piece of my growth and and a habit that I've continued for all these years. He was teaching me self-care and personal responsibility and how to take small actions to bring myself relief. He wasn't enabling me. He was making me follow through on my commitment. I had to learn to be independent rather than codependent because I was being lazy, really, and not writing it out. Or I wanted instant gratification by calling him and having him solve all my problems for me. That's what creates dependence. I couldn't be codependent and depend on him to give me relief. I had to learn to do things to solve my own problems, to depend on myself, to understand who I am and do the necessary things to make myself feel better, right? If he would have enabled me and took my calls without making me follow through with my responsibilities, then I would have continued to be lazy I would have not learned how to care for myself, and I would have depended on him to solve everything for me. Instead, he gave me the tools, and he expected me to stand on my own and do the things I said I would do. He made me responsible for myself and my actions. And I want you to think about this carefully, because you want to get sober, you want to stay sober. You want your anxiety to stop driving you crazy. You want to stop worrying. You want to understand what your future will look like. You want all your relationships to get better. You want to feel better. But you want it to happen instantly without doing any work or being uncomfortable. And there is no magic wand that I can wave and make all your troubles go away. If I could do the work for everyone and make everyone sober and happy instantly, I would do it. I promise you I would. I would do it for everyone. But as we live in reality, it doesn't actually work that way. There is no one big action you can take to magically be fixed. It's a series of small actions. It's being committed to doing what's right for you, doing the things that make you feel good about yourself, that bring you relief. It's in those tiny micro decisions we make hundreds of times a day, like deciding to write it out instead of looking for the shortcut and looking for something or someone else to give you the relief you want. When you want to feel better, and feel better about yourself and your life, you are the only one that can do that work and make it happen. When we're codependent, we rely on others to make us feel better. Now, fast forward a bit, when I was in college, um, I don't remember, I don't remember what part of college, because I've studied a lot of things, but Probably when I was studying neuropsychology or human psychology or maybe behavior psych, I don't know. But anyway, I learned that writing things out is actually its own therapeutic process. It's very healing and a great way to process through things. Then fast forward from there throughout my coaching career, as I progressed and trained more, um, got certified at higher levels, learned more coaching techniques and high level achievement stuff. I started learning the importance of writing down your plan or vision and goals. And I read this on ink.com and I wanted to share it with you. It said, you are 42% more likely to achieve your goals if you write them down. Writing your goals down not only forces you to get clear on what exactly it is that you want to accomplish, but doing so plays a part in motivating you to complete the tasks necessary for your success. That's huge. And probably the first 
little micro decision that most people F up, honestly, (laughs) that little tiny decision to take 10 minutes to put it on paper or blow it off and just keep it in your head. You're already setting yourself up for failure. You know, I'm all about micro decisions and I'm all about creating huge changes in life in only 10 to 15 minutes a day. That's it. If you can commit to taking action just 10 to 15 minutes per day, you will be blown away at how much you can accomplish and how much you can change yourself, your feelings, and your life. It's proven stuff, my friends. You can't argue with science and research. You don't even have to commit to 10 to 15 minutes at one time. Do five minutes in the morning, five at lunch, and five before bed. I don't care. But all of that being said, I wanted to lay some groundwork for you, for those of you who are really ready to stop screwing around and get serious about making changes. I wanted you to know from the start that taking pen to paper is your best bet. You can get a pen and paper and take everything we talk about today and spend 10 tiny minutes putting your thoughts on paper or listing some intentions so you're clear and ready to achieve. And so you don't have to take notes or worry about coming back later and listening again when you can take notes. I've already done it for you at www.myrecoverytoolbox.com forward slash blog. This episode is in written form with all five things that we're going to talk about highlighted for your convenience. And I will link that in the show notes, of course, so you can get there right from your podcast app, www.myrecoverytoolbox.com forward slash blog. And If you are on the email list, I will send this link out to the whole email list so you can just click one link and have it all at your tiny little sober fingertips, okay? Now, let's get into this topic today, five truths you must accept to beat addiction. A number one, addiction is not a weakness. Friends, I am not weak. And I'm saying that in all caps. I am not weak. I'm an addict through and through. And that does not make me a weak person. You are not weak because you have alcoholism and you can't heal yourself with sheer willpower and inner strength. If it worked like that, then everybody would get clean and sober with little effort and live happily ever after, and we wouldn't have 14,000 treatment centers in America. You have to get real about what is happening here and stop focusing on your pride and ego being bruised because you convince yourself it's a weakness. Put your pride and ego and hurt feelings aside, okay? This isn't about you. This is about your brain. Addiction changes your brain. I don't care how big and strong you think you are, you can't change science. And here's the brain deal. Addiction affects what is called the pleasure center in our brain. When we make money or have a great meal, have a drink, a pill, have sex, when happy things happen, Your brain releases dopamine for pleasure. Drugs and alcohol cause a flood of dopamine, which is why it feels so good. Then your brain stores that memory as a shortcut to pleasure and creates an automatic response of associating drugs and alcohol with pleasure. Listen to this. This is, I found this uh, from Harvard. It's an older article, but it explains it so clearly. I wanted to use these pieces of it. Repeated exposure to an addictive substance or behavior causes nerve cells in the nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain involved in planning and executing tasks. It causes those areas to communicate in a way that couples liking something with wanting it, in turn driving us to go after it. That is, this process motivates us to take action to seek out the source of pleasure. 
Now, I don't know how strong you think you are, but if you believe you can jump in there and get your neurotransmitters to behave differently and get all those chemical responses to do it your way, then you aren't human. This process has nothing to do with your strength or weakness. It's science. This is why we call it a brain disease. And to me, This is what we mean in AA when we talk about powerlessness. This is a brain illness. It changes the process in your brain. You have no control over that. The word powerless doesn't mean I'm weak and powerless in my life. It means there's a process happening inside of me that I have no power over. That's how it makes sense to me. Other people may view it a little differently. I don't know, but I assure you, I am not weak. I'm not powerless in my life and neither are you. If you get stuck in this victim role, playing the victim, feeling sorry for yourself because you think you're weak, what you're actually doing is dodging responsibility. If you can find a way to blame it on something or someone else, then you don't have to take responsibility for yourself and your actions. I took the actions that created my alcoholism by drinking alcohol for an extended period of time, which caused my brain to be hijacked because alcohol and drugs are poison. Okay, truth bomb. I poisoned myself over and over again. You are poisoning yourself. No one else is doing that for you. I took the actions that created my alcoholism, and now I have to take the actions to create my sobriety. The problem holding you back isn't alcoholism or being a weak human, most of the time it's just laziness. I truly believe 99% of the problem is laziness. You don't want to go to meetings of any sort. You don't want to tell anyone. You don't want to start journaling. You don't want to do any exercise. You don't want to practice reshaping your mindset. You don't want to go to treatment. You don't want to spend any money. You don't want to take time off work. You don't want to be uncomfortable or feel bad. You don't want to do anything. Alcoholism is not a weakness. However, laziness is. And that's totally in your power to change. And you know, I talk about this why I talk about laziness because it's my biggest affliction. (laughs) This is the thing that I battle on a daily basis. But it's also why all of my coaching and all of my programming is created to be as easy as possible. Because I have to spend my whole life coming up with I call them sober hacks, right? I have to come up with sober hacks to make my sobriety easy for me to achieve because really internally on a core level, I am lazy. I don't want to do anything either. That's why I make it as easy as humanly possible for you. But being an addict is not a weakness. And sometimes It's kind of weird because where I want to support you guys in your journey and getting through some of these challenging thoughts, at the same time, it's like when you're telling me that you feel like it's a weakness and something's wrong with you and you're defective, you're saying the same thing about me. And that's just simply not the truth. I am not weak. There is nothing weak about me. And I am an addict. So it's not a weakness. Okay. Big number two. Loss of control. It doesn't matter if you drink three glasses of wine or a gigantic bottle of vodka. It doesn't matter if you drink once a year or 12 hours a day. When your drinking or drug use starts bugging you, when you're thinking about it more often, when you recognize you are doing it more than you want to, When you start putting rules around it, like, I'm only going to do it on the weekends. I'll only drink wine. I'll only drink after 5 p.m. I will only drink after the kids are in bed. I will have a glass of water between each cocktail. I'll only have one drink an hour. I will never drink hard alcohol, only beer and wine. Yada, yada, yada. You know all the rules we try to make, and we usually screw that up too. And I know that because you wouldn't be listening to a podcast and seeking knowledge if you were doing it in a healthy way. You have to get to a place that you understand this is no longer within your control. When you're making those rules and breaking them and disappointing yourself, it's because you have lost control. When you are trying desperately to control something, 
it's because you've already lost control. I bring this up because so many of you want to stop over drinking, but you don't want to commit to stopping completely. And it makes me sad, to be honest, because you have yourself on a merry-go-round where you're just going in circles and you end up in the exact spot where you started, still drinking too much, still not feeling good about it, still in the battle and doing things that embarrass you or disappoint you and your family and friends, and you will get nowhere because you don't want to admit you've lost control. Remember, it's science. You're trying to play a game you can't win. It's rigged inside your brain for you to lose. That's why I say to you all the time, you have to make a commitment to stop completely. Because when you have one drink, you set a brain response into action that takes you to the place you don't want to be. And that's not to say that it's impossible to control it every once in a while. Even I could control my drinking every once in a while. And I'm a raging drunk. But on those few times I controlled my drinking, there was a lot of energy and planning that went into controlling it. Like I would make sure I didn't have any alcohol at home. Then I would wait until super late to go out. So I only had a couple of hours to drink. Then I may have even had someone else drive so I couldn't leave early and go to the liquor store. All of that just to make sure I didn't drink too much. Then I would talk about that one night to everyone. (laughs) I would tell everybody how great I did. I only had a few drinks. I just wasn't feeling it that night. To create this picture that I was in control because I knew I wasn't. If you know you have lost control in the situation, stop denying it. This is a life or death situation, and you have to understand that. I know it has to be difficult for those of you who don't drink a ton like I did to understand that you are in a death trap, but I'm here to tell you you are. You've probably already recognized how manipulative addiction is, how it preys on you and it makes you feel bad. It makes you lie and hide things and it will continue to do that. If you look closely at your life and the person you are today, I'm sure you can see some differences between you today and you at the beginning of your drinking. You can probably recognize some changes you aren't proud of, changes in your personality, becoming a person who will tell even little white lies when you never used to do that, becoming a person who will have a few drinks and drive your kids when you know that's not acceptable. Even if you aren't completely drunk, your reaction time is off, your attention is lacking, your judgment is impaired which I think is obvious by the fact that you will have a few drinks and drive your kids. Your judgment's impaired. Even after only a couple of drinks, it's not a great idea to drive. But we rationalize our actions because we don't want to give up drinking just to drive. What I really want you to understand is alcohol and drugs can kill you in a million ways, and you don't have to be all that drunk for it to happen. I can tell you a story of a woman who, after only a few glasses of wine, slipped in the shower, fell through her glass shower door, laying on her bathroom floor, bleeding to death. Or the dads who had a few drinks together while their son's baseball team was playing a game. They ended up in a fight. One punch was thrown. And as the guy fell to the ground, he hit his head on the curb, caused his brain to swell, and he died an hour later at the hospital. These are extreme examples, but I want you to understand that this will kill you. It may be in illness, various cancers that are related to alcohol abuse, seizures and alcohol withdrawal, driving drunk like me, a simple fall down the stairs because you lost your balance, or you get so depressed and sad and disappointed in yourself that you take your own life because you feel like you'll never win the battle. There are a million ways that alcohol can cause you harm. And it has nothing to do with who you are, how much money you have, or how great you think your life is. Understand that addiction is progressive. It will continue to get worse and it will single-handedly destroy your life if you give it the chance. I promise you, 
I never thought I would end up in jail. I am not a person who goes to jail. I don't come from a family where jail is normal. Okay? But there I was. Not because I did anything crazy either. I ended up in jail because I had a DUI and you're not supposed to drink while you're going through the legal system. But like a good alcoholic, I kept drinking and I got caught. So there I was in jail because I was so committed to my alcoholism that I wasn't even willing to give it up to avoid jail. That's how crazy this is. I made sure I got my hair done before I went in and I wore comfortable clothes and there I was sitting in jail in my $300 designer jeans and Louis Vuitton loafers surrounded by people who were actual criminals. If you think for a moment this stuff can't happen to you, just wait because you aren't in control. If you recognize you've lost control of your drinking and you don't get committed to stopping, It will continue to get worse, and it will ruin you, or even worse, kill you. Or kill someone else, which, as you know, was almost my story. Numero tres. Number three. Having a nice life doesn't mean you can't be addicted. Addiction doesn't have a look. And this is huge. People say to me, my clients say to me all the time, this is such a common misconception. They can't understand how they are alcoholic because they don't look like an alcoholic or they have a hard time calling themselves an alcoholic because of what that picture looks like to them. We have a picture in our minds of what an alcoholic or drug addict looks like and it doesn't usually look like you. I think Most people have a picture of the homeless person or the person who is down on their luck, maybe a young person who isn't thriving in life, being lazy, still living at home, not taking care of their responsibilities. And maybe that's the best way to describe it. You tend to think of an addict as someone who isn't thriving in life or doesn't have their shit together in some way. I'll tell you, though, the very first speed addict I ever worked with was a suburban mom doing carpool to the soccer games every week. She didn't work. She lived in a house that was almost a million dollars. Her kids went to the best schools. And she was stealing her kids' Adderall for energy. And for those of you who don't know, Adderall is a medication commonly prescribed for ADD. And Adderall is speed, by the way. It's one of the most addictive substances on the planet. Or, you know, another example, this whole wine mommy culture. If you think you're the only mom over drinking wine, you're sadly mistaken. I could also tell you about a business owner I worked with a long time ago, multimillionaire, crazy successful business, drove a $100,000 car, good looking guy, gorgeous wife, who is like one of the sweetest, kindest people I've ever met. I love her. And he liked to disappear for days at a time, hiding out in motels, smoking crack with prostitutes. Having a nice life doesn't mean addiction will skip you. Look at all the celebrities who battle alcoholism and drug addiction and gambling addiction and sex addiction. How many young stars have we seen take their own lives in recent years because the despair and sadness got the best of them? Demi Lovato didn't start her addiction with heroin. She probably started having a couple of glasses of wine with dinner or at a party. Addiction does not discriminate. It takes whoever it wants. Get rid of these ridiculous thoughts that you don't look like an alcoholic or a drug addict. Addiction doesn't have a certain look. You can be rich or poor, tall or short, happy or sad. If it wants you, it will take you. And this brings me to number four. You can't do it alone. You cannot get sober and stay sober alone. Listen, addiction needs a certain set of circumstances in order for it to live and thrive inside of you. It needs you to be isolated and lonely on some level. It needs you to feel bad about yourself and not believe in yourself. It needs you to have secrets that you are hiding. It needs you to be codependent so it can be your savior. 
And when I say isolated, I don't mean that you're never around people or that you're hiding out at home like a hermit. Sometimes that is the case. But for me, I was around people pretty regularly because I was a bartender. And when I wasn't working, I would go out with my friends. There were definitely times that I was very much alone at home and feeling sad, mostly because I would go home at the end of the night, right? Like I would go out to the bars with all my friends, but then when I would go home after the bars closed, I would be by myself and sad. But for the most part, I was around people. My isolation really was inside of me because I isolated myself from true connections. My walls were super high and all my friendships were surface level because I needed to hide who I was. And my friends weren't real friends. They were drinking friends. So I was isolated in the sense that no one knew who I was on the inside. No one knew my struggles or my sadness. I didn't share myself with a single person on the planet, not my true self. And when you aren't connected on a soul level with people who love you, you're isolated. And for me, that changed once I went to AA, right? Where I got all that love and acceptance and I knew it was safe in those rooms to really share who I was and to really share how sad I was on the inside because every single person in that room knew that same sadness. And that's when I got real. And that's when I came out of isolation and I wasn't hiding myself. I couldn't do it alone. You have to have somebody, a few somebodies that know what you're doing, that know what you're going through, that can support you appropriately, that can create accountability for you, right? You can't do it alone and there's no reason to. It's super lame and lonely and sad trying to do it by yourself. Last one, number five. There is no one path to becoming addicted. Some people have major trauma and drink to escape. Some people have alcoholic or drug addict parents and they just follow in their footsteps. Some people have health problems or surgeries and they get pain meds and that sends them down that road to addiction. And some of us just drink our way right into alcoholism. And others have mental health struggles that lead them to self-medicate, like anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder. It's not uncommon to start doing something casually and have it eventually spiral out of control. Again, this goes back to the internal scientific process that's taking place in your brain. It doesn't matter if it's two drinks or 20. If you have them on a regular basis, your brain will be hijacked. Non-alcoholic people do not drink enough to ever think about their drinking. Non-alcoholic people do not think about whether or not there will be alcohol at a gathering they want to attend. They never think about how much alcohol will be there or if they need to bring their own or if they need to stash some so they don't run out. Non-alcoholic people do not plan events around alcohol. They don't spend a bunch of money on it and they don't put rules on their drinking like we talked about earlier. And I promise you, non-alcoholic people will not drink anymore when they do something to embarrass themselves or their families or their partner. If they overdrink one night and do something crazy, they won't do it again. If they happen to get a DUI somehow, super rare, but if a non-alcoholic person got a DUI, it would be the only one because they will cut out drinking immediately. It's only addicted people that will continue partaking in substance, even when it's causing problems. We keep drinking despite legal troubles. We continue to drink after we get into horrific fights with our spouses or drive our kids when we're under the influence or even after we miss an important meeting or a family event because we were drunk or hungover. Non-alcoholic people never wonder if they are alcoholic because they never think about alcohol because they don't drink enough to wonder if they are drinking too much. 
And just like there is no one path to addiction, there's also not one path to recovery. There are certain things you have to do if you want to recover and be free from all the anxiety and drama and heartbreak of addiction. You have to make a commitment and be diligent in working on yourself even when you don't feel like it. You have to understand that we lack the ability to moderate and that's why we can't have just one. And you have to share with a few trusted people exactly who you are and the decision you've made. You have to share yourself to create accountability and get love and support. Now, before we close, let's recap. Five truths you must accept to battle addiction. One, addiction is not a weakness. Number two, you've lost control. Number three, having a nice life doesn't mean you can't be addicted. I don't care how rich you are, living in the right zip code, you've got the house, you've got the look, you wear the right clothes. I don't care. If addiction wants you, it's going to take you. You can't do it alone. Stop isolating yourself, people. Stop hiding from who you are. Find some people you trust and love and that trust and love you, and let's get this thing handled, okay? Stop trying to do it alone. And number five, there's no one path to becoming addicted. Again, if you are listening to this and wishing you could take some notes, I've already done it for you. You can get it at www.myrecoverytoolbox.com forward slash blog, and I will link that in the show notes so you can get it right from your podcast app. And for those of you who want more support and you're ready to take big steps and get off this roller coaster ride of clean and relapse, sober and relapse, making promises to yourself, then breaking them, you can always work with me directly. And I will link that in the show notes as well. And remember too, we just did our first round of updates on the recovery starter kit. So if you already own the recovery starter kit, it's a great time to go back through it, get yourself back on track, get yourself some new accountability, just go through that program again, do a little reboot and reset and recharge. And if you're interested in the starter kit, definitely jump over there and grab it at www.myrecoverytoolbox.com. I'll link that in the show notes as well. But you have lifetime access to that product. It's super inexpensive and you will have it forever as I consistently update it. I'll always update it as I learn new tools and techniques and new research. So it will kind of always consistently be a new product, totally worth the money. It's so cheap, you guys, and and you have it forever. It's a great tool to use forever and ever and ever. So that's all I've got for today. I hope you love this episode. I hope there's a lot of great information. Again, don't worry about grabbing a pen and paper and listening to it again if you don't want to to take notes. Just jump over there and grab that on the blog. I link it in the show notes. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Thank you again for spending some time with me and I will see you next week. You've reached the end of another great episode of the Addiction Unlimited podcast candid and honest conversation about addiction and recovery. Be sure to visit us at addictionunlimited.com to join the conversation and access show notes and links to everything we talked about. Love this episode? Please take 30 seconds to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes to help us improve and give you the information you want. Thanks for listening. See you next week.